morning out there in YouTube land. Welcome back to another episode of Greg's Waters and More. Today is the Sabbath day and it's Saturday. Shabbat Shalom to you. Um, I'm here with another message today, or teaching if you will. I don't like to call them. I don't like to, I don't like to use the word preaching because I, I don't want to preach at you. That, that's just not what I feel I'm called to do. I do feel like I'm called to share the truth of God's word with you. Share the things that God teaches me and that I learn. And uh, I think today that's what we're going to do. The Lord's pressed it on my heart to uh, talk about the Ten Commandments today. And as a matter of fact, uh, I had what I believed was a message wrote, and then I got corrected on it that it's actually supposed to be two separate messages. I thought they were one. And so yesterday, I sat at the di at the uh, kitchen table and wrote. One, two, three, almost four whole pages. <laughs> I had a message wrote, and then I turned around and wrote it again yesterday. So, uh, the Lord knows what He's doing. But anyways, we're uh, we're out here today. We're on our patio, this beautiful little patio set my wife did this summer. Thought it'd be nice to rest on the Sabbath and sit down. I'm a little bit tired today, but uh, we gotta get this out there for for the Lord for the kingdom. So let's start off with a word of prayer, shall we? Abba Father, thank you so much for everything that you do for us, Lord. Thank you for this beautiful Sabbath day, Lord, for the, uh, for the birds and the trees, for Fraggle. Thank you for Fraggle, Lord. Um, thank you for your word that you give so freely. Thank you for the knowledge and the wisdom that you bless us with, Father. Thank you for the Sabbath day of rest, for a day where we're allowed to learn more about you, Lord. Um, and that truly is the greatest blessing to get to learn to know you better and to invite you into our soul and our spirit. So with that, Father, I just pray this morning that you would open eyes and hearts and ears this morning, Lord, that your word would be received. Um, I pray that those who have asked for knowledge and wisdom of you, I pray, Lord, that uh, you would bless them with that through the Holy Spirit. And please, God, let, let your words come through and not my own. I surrender myself unto you, Lord. Uh, let the Holy Spirit work in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus. Amen. All right. This message. I really hope Fraggle doesn't mess the audio up on this. He's trying really hard over there. But anyway, um, this message is the Ten Commandments, God's moral law. Simple, straightforward. That's what we're going to talk about. Um, and to start off with, we need to be in Exodus chapter 20. So if you'll turn there with me this morning. And, uh, we'll get into Exodus chapter 20. Now Exodus chapter 20 is where basically the Ten Commandments are handed to Moses. God lays them all out. And uh, we're just going to go through my notes and go through the scriptures here. So, I'll start in my notes. What are the Ten Commandments? God's moral laws, how we are intended to live, how we honor God. Given to Moses in Exodus 20 and repeated and echoed throughout the Old and the New Testaments. So we're going to start off in Exodus chapter 20. And uh, we're going to start Exodus chapter 20 verse 1. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And in, in, in Exodus chapter 3, we see the first commandment of God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. We also see this echoed in Deuteronomy 5, 7, 2 Kings 17, 35. So, shall have no other gods before me. Nothing. Not any other gods. There is no other way. God is the one true God. Jesus Christ, His Son, is the one true Messiah. Um, so now, let's go, to, let's go to number two, which is going to be Exodus, 20, chapter, Exodus chapter 20, verse 4. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Okay. So let's go to my notes here, which I have that 
have that very thing written down there. It said, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. This is very descriptive. And this commandment causes many to stumble because they do not take it seriously. Any graven image in your home becomes a doorway for evil spirits. God means this literally. He is a jealous God. Anything you bow down to or choose over him is idolatry. It is false God worship. Now, I want to elaborate here a little bit. I just feel like I need to elaborate. So we see this. I believe it's actually before Exodus 20. I believe it's in Exodus 18 where Moses gets called up on the mount to be with God. He's up there 40 days and 40 nights and the, uh, the Israelites being a stiff-necked, impatient people. They, uh, they go to Aaron and say, they make us, uh, make us a god. So he takes all their earrings and all their jewelry, melts it down and makes a golden calf. And that's very significant, but it doesn't seem that way to us because we don't know the whole history. You see, when the Israelites were in, G in, in Egypt, they saw all the Egyptian gods. They actually worshipped some of the Egyptian gods. And the calf represented Hathor or Horus. Um, basically a bull or a calf or a female cow. Um, Hathor was the goddess of fertility and pleasure and you know all these other things. Uh, Horus was the god of protection. They actually have this thing that's called the Eye of Horus, which is like the all-seeing eye. Um, but that's getting into something else. So anyway, they make this golden calf, they bow down to it, they worship it, and they're sitting there basically doing the same things they did in Egypt. God just brought them out of all that bondage, and they go right back to it. I believe it's in 2 Peter where it says, as a dog returns to its vomit. You know, I, I can't make it much clearer than that. Also, I believe it's in uh, 2 Chronicles. Actually, it's probably in Kings somewhere too, I just don't remember it. But uh, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, created two golden calves and made Israel to worship them and created them, made them to sin greatly. So God doesn't like those little idols, um, no matter what they might be. You might think something is holy. It isn't. Remember the second commandment. No image of anything that is in heaven above, earth beneath, the water under the earth. It doesn't matter if it's a dolphin, a picture of an angel, a picture of the false Jesus that we think is Jesus. That is a graven image and you need to get rid of that. That is just going to do nothing but cause you to stumble and open doors that don't need to be opened. Sorry for the break right in the background. Anyways. Take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. It's pretty self-explanatory. It is rank blasphemy to take the name of the Lord in vain. Don't do it. I want to jump in here 
and I'm just going to be a little humble for a minute because when I was younger, I was one of the worst offenders of this. I I would throw the GD word out there all the time. It was common in my sentences, and I, I used the JC in vain all the time. And when God first started to move in my life, this was one of the first things that he helped me to do away with. And I can honestly say that I have not done this in a very, very long time now. God has literally removed that iniquity from my life and that sin from my life. He sanctified me from that, and I am so thankful to him for it. If you are an offender of that word, there is, there is hope and there is salvation through Jesus Christ for you for that. You need to pray, ask, humble yourself, and repent of it, and turn from it, and God will help you. He will show mercy unto you, because that is one of his commandments, and he will always help you to be able to stand and keep his commandments. If you want to, it's your choice. It's, it's your free will to serve the Lord or not. He gives you that choice. If he forced you to do it and be slave worship, it wouldn't mean anything. God wants your heart. He wants you to worship him and love him with his whole heart. That, that's what it's all about. He loves you and he wants to protect you from these things. That if you don't do them, they're just going to eat you up. They'll eat you up inside and they'll cause you to stumble. So anyway, we already did Exodus uh, 27. Shall not take the Lord's name in vain. Okay, Exodus 20, 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Also have here a reference to Exodus 31, 13 and Deuteronomy 5, 12. Uh, let's see here. So that's echoed throughout scripture, but I want to finish this first. I'm having a hard time staying focused. I'm sorry, guys. Exodus 28 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy maidservant, nor thy manservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So, God worked six days, he rested the seventh is what we're doing today on the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day, if you haven't watched the uh, the teaching on the Sabbath day on the channel, please do that. I feel you'll be blessed by it. Um, we go into great detail about what the Sabbath is, how it should and shouldn't be observed, um, things that you can and can't do on the Sabbath. God, God wants to use the Sabbath to bless you. The man was made for Sabbath, not Sabbath for man. Uh, I probably got that backwards. But anyways, a lot of people think the Sabbath has been done away with, and that is not true. That's absolutely not true. But that's another teaching. But uh, we see here in the Ten Commandments of God, God's moral law, keep the Sabbath holy. Don't work for money on the Sabbath. Don't do it. If your neighbor needs help, help them. If you have a sick animal, take care of them. There's no law against doing good on the Sabbath, but make sure that that good is what God calls good and not what the world calls good. There is a difference there. I'll just leave that point. Um, so let's see here. Now this is echoed all throughout the Old and the New Testament. Whether you believe it or not, the New Testament believers, New Testament writers basically, they did keep the Sabbath day. They did go to the synagogues on the Sabbath day. Um, I mean, they kept the food laws. They, they kept all those things. It was very important to them. And a lot of people like to say that, you know, well, the New Testament says that Jesus did away with this and Jesus did away with that. I'm sorry, but that's just not true. you got to understand, the New Testament writers, they didn't have the New Testament. All they studied was Torah. They studied the Old Testament of God. That is where they got their scripture from. That was the scripture to them. The New Testament books, I mean, yes, they were written down, but they weren't assembled into what you call a Bible until much later. you got to realize that you got to keep all this stuff in context, otherwise you will be led astray. All right. Now let's go to, um, I believe it's the fifth commandment here. 
and I have Exodus 20 and 12. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Also see Exodus 23, 26 and Deuteronomy 5, 16 referenced here. So, your parents were chosen by God long before you were born. God knew the world needed you in it. For a specific purpose, honor and respect your parents. This does not apply in abusive situations. If you're married, your spouse is always your first priority. You're called to choose your spouse, to cleave to your spouse, and leave your parents. I just want to I just want to go into this a little bit more here now, for what it means to honor and respect your parents. That does not mean that you bow down to them. That does not mean that you cow tow to your parents. It means that you keep the commandments of God, and if you are a child, a younger person, a teenager, anybody that's you know under the age of 18 years old, if your parents tell you to do something, you do it. I mean, except for you know breaking one of the commandments of God, something like that. If you know it's a sin, no, don't do that. Okay, God is always the highest authority. Always, God's word always has to come first. Now, abusive situations. I, I, could, I could go into just hours upon hours of talking about this because we see more and more of that in our world as time goes by. And if you don't have godly parents, I feel for you. I really do. Now, my parents did the best they knew how. They, they weren't really following the ways of God the way they should be. Um, I've recently had to kind of try to show my mom the right ways, and, and she's learning, and I, I pray she fully comes around. I really do. Um, I don't speak to my dad. We do not have a relationship. Um, and I will just say that I... I wound up having to remove him from my life for unhealthy reasons. Um, so when I'm talking about this commandment right here, it is a hard one to talk about. It can be for those of you out there who, despite your best efforts, you really wanted to honor and love your parents, but it just it didn't happen that way. And God made it where you had to make a call, had to make a decision. and. You know, sometimes you just have to make that choice, and God will honor you in making the right decision. He always does. He will bless you for that every time. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't pray for that person. I, I pray for my dad. I pray for him all the time. Do I still love him? Absolutely. Do I forgive him? Yes. But forgiveness and letting somebody come back in and do the same thing is a totally different scenario. And... I feel like I've already talked enough on this point. I'm not going to go into it any further because we got three more whole pages of notes here and a bunch of scriptures to get through. But I really hope that this is helpful to you. I really do. All right, so we're going to go to the sixth commandment here. Exodus 20, 13. Thou shalt not kill. Also see right here Deuteronomy 5, 17 is mentioned here. So, oh, thou shalt not kill. Do not murder other people. It's evil. Um, you know, you got the story of Cain and Abel. God accepted Abel's sacrifice to animals. Cain's sacrifice was not accepted. Now, I don't think that's something about, about fruits and vegetables there because God created it all. What I think it is is it's a heart issue. Um, Abel's heart was genuinely seeking God, and Cain's was not. Cain's heart was... Uh, was high and mighty and he probably thought he was all that in a bag of chips if you want my opinion on it but it led to the first led to the first murder uh, killing his own brother his own, his own flesh and blood and uh, in Genesis it says that Abel's blood cried out from the ground to God and that's how God knew and I believe that still happens today the blood of the uh, blood of the innocently slain cries out to God. There's stuff in Revelation about that too, if you're curious about that. Abortion, child and infant sacrifice, etc. 
Um, I think I want to look at Deuteronomy 5.17 here. I just, I don't remember what that scripture says, but it's, I got it written down here. So let's have a look at it real quick. Deuteronomy 5.17, Thou shalt not kill. It just references you back to Exodus 20.13. Um, abortion is one thing that God really is not happy with. Um, child and infant sacrifice was a huge thing in the Old Testament. And uh, it still is today. While we don't have the huge the huge uh, god of Moloch where they'd light the fire and literally set the infant child in its arms to roll down into the fiery belly. Um, we have abortion clinics where, where these poor women who have gone through things that they shouldn't go through go in there and uh, you know cause these infants that God has knit together and uh, they literally get tore apart piece by piece in the womb. It talks about uh, in the Old Testament, I, I believe it was Elijah or Elisha, they, they, got, they got sent by God to go talk to somebody that was going to become the king and they wept because they saw this, this guy that was going to be king and he was ripping the wombs open and taking the babies out. And, uh, when I hear somebody talk about abortion today, that's what I see in my head. That, that's what the Spirit gives me. It really is an abomination to God and it breaks God's heart every time. And the world wants to get so caught up in, uh, you know, genocide and, and all these things and all these foreign wars and oppression. And I don't believe there's any greater genocide or oppression than the killing of innocent unborn children in the world. Now, do I know that there are circumstances out there? Yes, I know that there's rapes. I know that there's, you know, one night stands and all those things. But at the end of the day, we are accountable for our actions. We have to be. This is why we have this. This is why we have these commandments to guide us in our life, to help us try to make these, these decisions. I mean, God wants us to judge righteous judgment and make good decisions that honor him these are here for our protection that's what these are here for to protect your mind body soul and spirit the way that you were designed by god himself and if you're if you're a woman out there and you're facing this choice please i i pray you go find godly counsel and if you're not in a position where you're able to keep this child please consider adoption Please, I, I know that's a whole other topic, and I know the things I'm speaking of here are very taboo in today's society. But uh, killing a killing a fetus is, is not not of God. God is not okay with that. And I just pray that the Holy Spirit leads you where you need to go. Um, all right, so we're going to move on to the seventh commandment now. Exodus chapter 20 verse 14 Thou shalt not commit adultery This is another, another big one today So Thou shalt not commit adultery Exodus 20 14 Be faithful to your spouse Don't commit fornication or adultery with someone else's spouse Jesus was very clear on adultery and lust In Matthew 5 27 through 32 So we're going to go there We're going to go to Matthew 5 27 through 32 and we are going to see what Jesus had to say about the subject in the New Testament mind you alright I got Matthew chapter 5 and I'm already in 26 so. now I went all the way back to Zechariah alright Matthew 5 27 through 32. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. It shows Exodus 20:14 being referenced there. 
But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath already committed hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. It hath been said, Whoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. Again, ye have heard that it has been said of them by old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shall perform unto the Lord thine oaths. That's going into something else I read that I got I got to read in there. I'm sorry. So anyway, even if you look at a woman lustfully, that is adultery in the eyes of Jesus. Something that uh, this world today is just going right down the toilet on. Really, really badly. I mean, you you can't even turn on the TV anymore or go anywhere without seeing these lustful images and. Uh, satanic rituals on your TV and you know satanic symbolism all over the place my wife and I were in Walmart I believe yesterday and I saw a bunch of satanic symbols in Walmart on some things and called it out if it breaks God's heart it should break yours too that's 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 literally how I feel about it um, have no, have nothing to do with the fruitful, unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them in some scripture that the Holy Spirit just brought to my mind. So, with that being said, let's uh, move on to the eighth commandment. Go back to Exodus twenty, fifteen. Thou shalt not steal. That's another big one. Um, the next town over from us a couple of nights ago had three cars stolen usually a quiet night there but uh, the big town over there about 30 miles away they've had all kinds of young people breaking into people's cars and stealing things and stealing the cars joyriding them around crashing them and stuff and uh, God doesn't like it when you steal something it's not for you I, I truly believe everybody knows that theft is wrong. If you wouldn't like it done to you, don't do it to somebody else. I, I believe it's as simple as that. Now, let's go to the ninth commandment. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Exodus 20, 16. Tell the truth. Do not play favorites or put one person over another. God is not a respecter of persons. And that's very true. I can't think of the scriptures right now, and I didn't write them down in here, but it says it throughout the Old and New Testament that God is not a respecter of persons. Um, God doesn't play favorites. It's that simple. So, when they bring you into a courtroom and they ask you to swear off on the Bible, you're not supposed to swear off, by the way. But, uh, you know, if you swear to tell the whole truth, so help you God. That comes from this commandment right here. Bearing false witness is one of the things that God does not like. He likes people to tell the truth always. And the truth can be a very hurtful and painful thing to do, but we got to do it. All right. So the tenth and final commandment in Exodus 17. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is in thy neighbor's house. Deuteronomy 5.21, Proverbs 6.29 are mentioned here. So, do not be jealous or envious of what other people have. Don't lust over things. God gives and takes away as he sees fit. He is the ultimate righteous judge who knows and searches the hearts of all mankind. Uh, I'm going to get into an example here. 
verse that I want to use, and go figure, I forgot to write down the verse. Um, darn it, how did I forget to write down that verse? Because I really wanted to read that. Um, it's going to be in the first book of Kings, so let me see if I can find that real quick here. Thank you, Lord, for that. I'm really sorry for this. Really am. I should have done a better job of this. I don't know why I missed that, but uh, hopefully I'll figure that out. It's starting to sprinkle. I'm thankful, to the Lord, for that because we need the rain. Fail. It's not what I'm after. There's a perfect example of uh, Ahab here, and he violates almost all the commandments. Here we go. First Kings chapter 21. And it came to pass after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard which was in Jezreel, hard by the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. And Ahab spake unto Nabal, saying, Give me thy vineyard, that I may have it for a garden of herbs, because it is near unto my house, and I will give thee for it a better vineyard than it. Or if it seem good to thee, I will give thee the worth of it in money. And Nabal said to Ahab, The Lord forbid it me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. And Ahab came into his house heavy and displeased because of the word which Nabal the Jezreelite had spoke to him. For he had said, I will not give thee the inheritance of my fathers. And he laid him down, went down upon his bed, and turned away his face, and would eat no bread. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him, and said unto him, Why is thy spirit so sad that thou eatest no bread? And he said unto her, Because I spake unto Naboth the Jezreelite, and said unto him, Give me thy vineyard for money, or else if it please thee, I will give thee another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give thee my vineyard. And Jezebel, his wife, said unto him, Dost thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? Arise and eat bread, and let thine heart be merry. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. So he wrote letters in Ahab's name, and sealed them with a seal, and sent the letters unto the elders, and to the nobles that were in his city, dwelling with Naboth. And she wrote in the letters, saying, Proclaim a fast, and set Naboth on high among the people, and set two men sons of Belial, if you're not familiar with the term sons of Belial, that basically means sons of the devil, evil people, set two men, sons of Belial, before him to bear witness against him, false witness. Right there, saying, thou didst blaspheme God and the king, and then carry him out and stone him that he may die. And the men of his city, even the elders and the nobles, who were the inhabitants of the city, did as Jezebel had sent unto them. And as it was written in the letters which she had sent unto them, they proclaimed a fast and set Naboth on high among the people. And there came in two men, children of Belial, and set before him. And the men of Belial witnessed against him, even against Naboth, in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth did blaspheme God and the king. Then they carried him forth out of the city and stoned him with stones that he died. Then they sent to Jezebel, saying, Naboth is stoned and is dead. And it came to pass, when Jezebel heard that Naboth was stoned and was dead, that Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise and take possession of the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite, which he refused to give thee for money. For Naboth is not alive, but dead. And it came to pass, when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, that Ahab arose, rose up to go down to the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite, to take possession of it. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, which is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, whither he has gone down to possess it. And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord. Any time you hear, Thus saith the Lord, you better, your ears better perk up and you better listen. 
hast thou killed and also taken possession? And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, In the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick the blood even thine. And Ahab said unto Elijah, Hast thou found me, O mine enemy? And he answered, I have found thee, because thou hast sold thyself to work evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring evil upon thee, and will take away thy posterity, and will cut off from Ahab him that pisseth against the wall, and him that is shut up and left in Israel, and will make thine house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah, for the provocation wherewith thou hast provoked me to anger and made Israel to sin. And of Jezebel also spake the Lord, saying, The dogs shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Him that dieth of Ahab in the city the dogs shall eat, and him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. But there was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezreel, Jezebel his wife stirred up. And he did very abominably in following idols according to all things, as did the Amorites, whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. And it came to pass, when Ahab heard those words, that he rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his flesh, and fasted, and lay in sackcloth, and went softly. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Seest thou how Ahab humbleth himself before me? Because he humbleth himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days, but in his son's days I will bring the evil upon his house. So, all right. So right here I got some notes on this I want to read. So Ahab at the, in the vineyard of Naboth is a good example of not only violating the do not covet command, but also thou shall not kill. We also see here Ahab repenting in sackcloth and ashes and see God honoring Ahab's repentance. God is very merciful. God uses his commandments to prove whether people will follow him and keep his ways or not. See that in Exodus 20, 18 through 26, which I'm going to read here in a minute. But I just want to go back to this uh, this First Kings passage here. Ahab and Jezebel were evil, very, very evil. Um, they worshipped Baal. They worshipped false gods. They had idols. They they caused Israel to stumble in sin. Um, all throughout history of the world. The leaders have caused the people to stumble and sin by their laws and their rules and their statutes. False God worship, and that still continues today. Um, this whole country is caught up in red or blue, Democrat or Republican. I used to be right there with you, and uh, I don't do that anymore. You know, the political system, it, 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 it's... it's it's a shell game. It's literally a circus to get you involved so that you're not going to focus on what's truly important. You focus on the Word of God, you do your best to live by that, and you'll be just fine. It's not about red and blue. You can't put them in the place of God. God rules, God sets up the kings, God sets up the leaders of the world. Okay? God placed Saul on the throne. God placed King David on the throne. It really is as simple as that. I could go on for hours on that too, and I'm sure there's those of you out there that will disagree with me and agree with me on that point. Um, but, but anyway, back to my point here. They literally violated most of the commandments of God right here. He coveted this vineyard. He wanted it so bad he wouldn't even eat. He was so discouraged, upset. Don't do that. They bear false. They had somebody bear false witness against this man to get him killed. So you had him murdered for a false report. Then you went in and took something that wasn't yours to take. That's stealing. It's also coveting. Um, but the good thing here is that God honored Ahab's repentance. Ahab knew he was wrong. He humbled himself. He tore his clothes. He put on the sackcloth. He put ashes on his head. And he just sat there in the dust for a while. And he talked to God. Lord help me I'm a sinner 
you think about that. Somebody that wicked, God can touch their heart. God can touch anybody's heart. Nobody's too far gone for God to touch. Nobody. So we're going to read Exodus 20, 18 through 26 here. All right. And uh, all and all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear, but let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you, and that his fear may not be, and that his fear may be before your faces, that ye sin not. Uh, okay, I gotta go down to 26. And the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. And the Lord said unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, You have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. Ye shall not make with me gods of silver, neither shall ye make unto you gods of gold. An altar of earth thou shalt make unto me, and shalt sacrifice thereon thy burnt offerings and thy peace offerings, thy sheep and thine oxen. In all places where I record my name, I will come unto thee, and I will bless thee. And if thou wilt make me an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it up of hewn stone. For if thou lift up thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. Neither shalt thou go up by steps unto mine altar, that thy nakedness be not discovered thereon. So we see here, the ways that we honor and worship God are very specific. Granted, these are the Old Testament ones. Um, where they sacrificed animals to cover their sin. We're under a new system now. So, we see God proving the, proving the Israelites. God cares greatly for his creation and about their sin. He is a holy God and cannot stand sin. Sin is separation from God. Transgression of God's law or rules. And uh, I know there's going to be some of you out there that, you know, well, we're under grace, we're not under the law. And, and that's true. However, you can't advocate lawlessness. There are rules. The Ten Commandments still apply. You can't just throw them out. You cannot do that. Then you advocate lawlessness. And I'm sorry, but the perfect sinless Savior of the world, he's not okay with lawlessness. Lawlessness, he's not. So... We're going to go to some New Testament passages here. We're going to go to John chapter 14. Look at that. Spun right to it. Alright. John 14. 15 through 31. Read the whole thing. This is Jesus speaking here. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray to the Father. And he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not. Neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it thou wilt manifest thyself unto us, and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, if a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him, and make our abode with him. He that loveth me, me not, keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things I have spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I say unto you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away, and come again unto you. If ye love me, you would rejoice, because I said, I go unto the Father, 
for my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it come to pass, that when it is come to pass you might believe. Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh, and hath nothing in me. But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Arise and let us go hence. So, if you love me, keep my commandments, Jesus said. What commandments is he talking about? He's talking about the Ten Commandments right here. That's what he's talking about. So it says, a lot of people today teach that the Ten Commandments are no longer valid. This is a lie from the pit of hell. To believe and teach so is to teach lawlessness. Or rather, the motto of the Satanists, do what thou wilt. Jesus states the greatest commandments in Matthew 22, 36 through 40. Which by just these two things, here all the laws of, here hang all the laws of the prophets and the law. Indeed, by paying attention to, to do these, we will fulfill the Ten Commandments and both Old and New Testaments. So let's go to Matthew chapter 22. What a beautiful Sabbath morning. The sun's starting to peek out. I'm loving it. Matthew 22, 36 through 40. Master, which is the great, the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So, right there, and it says the second like unto it, thou shalt love the neighbor as thyself. References Leviticus 19.18, Old Testament verse, Mark 12.31, Romans 13.9. So we see here, Jesus is not telling us <clears throat> that the Ten Commandments are null and void. He's saying by keeping these two alone, doing these two things, you fulfill all ten of those. That's what he's saying. So, Jesus did not come to change anything other than the Levitical priesthood. No more animal sacrifices. Jesus was there in the beginning, in Genesis, at the creation. So, I'm going to go into this right now because I want to prove this to you. God wants you to know this. This is very important. Now, God was there in the beginning, in Genesis, in the creation. We're going to go to John 1 and read 1 through 4. find it. All right. John's Gospel. Apologize. Fingers are not working very well today. All right. John chapter 1 verse 1 through 4. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. So, right there, John's saying, in the beginning, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, the Word was with God. Jesus was there, right there. First pages of Genesis. Jesus was there. Okay. So, he was there when the very hand of God wrote the commandments and handed them to Moses. Exodus 31, 18. Exodus 31. 31 and 18 and he gave unto Moses when he had made the end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai two tables of testimony tables of stone written with the finger of God if it's written with the finger of God and God was there in the beginning and Jesus was there in the beginning do you think that Jesus was there when God wrote these, uh, wrote these tables of stone and handed them to Moses Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration with Moses wasn't he he already knew him Jesus was there so, he was there with Abraham. 
and he's still alive today, sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us on our behalf. It is our reasonable service to do our absolute best to hold fast in the faith and to keep the commandments and to love God with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. So, I got Genesis uh, chapter 18 written here. Go look at that. Genesis 18 wants me to read the whole thing. Okay, and the Lord appeared unto him, talking about Abraham, in the plains of Mamre, and he said in the tent door in the heat, he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day, and he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground. And he said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servants. Let a little water, I pray you, be fed, and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort ye your hearts, after that ye shall pass on. For therefore are ye come to your servant. And they said, So do as thou hast said. And Abraham hastened into the tent unto Sarah. And he said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the hearth. And Abraham ran into the herd, and fetched a calf tender and good, and gave it unto a young man, and he hasted to dress it. And he took butter and milk, and the calf which he had dressed, and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree, and they did eat. And they said unto him, Where is Sarah, where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent which was behind with the tent door which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were well were old and stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Surely shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Then Sarah denied, saying, I laugh not, for she was afraid. And he said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. So we see the God here. We see God here. Uh, Sarah laughs at him. And he says, Is anything too hard for me? And then he's kind of sarcastically, this is how I see it. He's sarcastically. She's, she's, like, she's like, I didn't laugh. He's like, Oh, yeah, you laughed. I saw that, you know. And the men rose up from thence and looked toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I shall do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. And then it goes into the, uh, the sale of Sodom and Gomorrah. Right there. But we see here, the Lord, the Tetragrammaton, yod heh vav -Hey, that's what that capital L-O-R-D means in the King James Bible. So, God in the flesh literally comes to, to visit Abraham, sit down and have a meal with him, and tell him he's going to be a dad. Now we got John chapter 858 here. Sorry we're bouncing around a lot. A lot of scriptures here. All right, John H fifty-eight. All right, we got Jesus sitting here talking to the Pharisees, and he says, "Jesus say, said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am." Referencing Exodus three fourteen and John seventeen five. You got it written in red right there. I say to you, before Abraham was, I you just sitting there saying, I was there in Abraham's time. All right, what else do we got here? Um, got Hebrews 1 3. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. We're talking about uh, we're talking about Jesus sitting down at the right hand of the Father here is what we're talking about. 
who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the power of by the word of word of his power when he had when he had by himself purged our sins sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high so there's Hebrews 1 3 says Hebrews 12 2 Hebrews 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So right there, we got Jesus sitting down at the right hand of the Father. I got 1 Peter 3.22 also. Peter 3:22 Oh come on, give me the page. 1 Peter 3:22 Who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. Acts chapter 7 55 and 56 Some of you, this might seem a little monotonous and boring to go through all these scriptures. However, let everything be established by two or three witnesses, verses or people. You should always let scripture interpret scripture. If you don't do that, you're asking for uh, you're asking for trouble. All right, Acts chapter seven, fifty-five and fifty-six. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly unto heaven, and saw the glory of God as Jesus standing on the right hand of God, and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing in the right hand of God. So, right there, we see Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father by multiple witnesses. So now, let's move on here a little bit. I just want to... Uh, want to uh, kind of say this right here we're called to be a peculiar people we're called to be separate from the world so we're going to go to 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9 that's 2nd Peter sorry for that I'm in the wrong one 1 Peter chapter 2 right here talking about us but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. I'm going to read verse 10 here also. Which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, amen. So we're going to go back to Deuteronomy 14.2, so we can have an Old Testament here. I passed Deuteronomy already. Deuteronomy 14 and 2. Oh, okay, this is uh, different than what I thought here. You shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. All right. So, a lot of modern Bible translations, they add to or they take away, they change the words. Um, the King James Bible is a word-for-word -word English translation from the original text. Modern Bibles use different texts. They, they interpret things differently. You're not getting the real inerrant truth of God when you use the NIV, the ESV, things of that nature. So now we need to uh, separate ourselves from the ways of the world. So we're going to go to John 
17. John chapter 17. Okay, 17, 16 through 26. This is Jesus speaking right here. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. The word is thy truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes... For their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be as one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, and that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest, gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them, as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and, in them, and I in them. So we see right there, John 17, 16 through 26, supposed to be separated from the world. We're in the world, we're not of it. Okay? Love God. Love the Father, love the Son, love the Holy Spirit, love them all. Now I got here uh, 2 John, 2 John, 9 through 11, for the final verse. So let's find that. See the final verse, and then we'll uh, close our study here. 2 John 9 through 11. Whosoever transgresseth, dresseth, and abide not in the doctrine of Christ, hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God's speed. For he that biddeth him God's speed is a partaker of his evil deeds. So, right there, the doctrine of Christ. What is the doctrine of Christ? It's the red letters that Jesus spoke to us. That is the doctrine of Christ. And it does not violate or change the Old Testament. The only thing it changes is how we atone for our sins. Jesus Christ, who had died, of a cross, died on the cross, he was the inerrant son of God, born of a virgin. The ultimate sacrificial lamb. Perfect in all his ways. He sinned not. Jesus Christ, the same today, yesterday, and today, he changes not. They beat him with whips with metal tips on the end. They sheared his flesh. They put a crown of thorns on his head. They cast lots for his clothes. They hung him on a tree naked. He died for your sins and for my sins. As I said earlier, it's our reasonable service to do our very best to keep the commandments of God. And if we're unable to do that, then we should do like Ahab, Ahab, Ahab did. We should humble ourselves and repent from those things. And then God will show mercy unto us through, through the blood of Jesus Christ, which atones for all our sins. He atones for our sins. The work of the cross is a finished work. But you got to die to yourself daily. God will help you through these things. Whether it's drug addiction, you know, anything. It could be anything that you're struggling with. Food addiction, you know. I mean, I, I've struggled with that my whole life. God wants to help you with it. He wants to walk with you through this life. The only thing you need to do is let him. Invite Jesus into your heart. Make him Lord of your life. Believe the gospel of Christ. Believe the doctrine of Christ. Believe the words written in this book. This book is salvation. It is the way, the true, and eternal life. I really do pray that you have been blessed by this, this message today. And I thank the Lord above for letting me do it. So until next time, thank you so much for watching. Have a great day. Shabbat Shalom. God bless.